So I guess this is lunch and learn, and our coordinator is, is Georgia Smith, who's not here. Um, so the lunch part is proceeding, and I guess we'll start with the learn part. Uh, I'm Bob Meenan. I'm the dean here at the School of Public Health. And um, I was asked to talk about the school and sort of the history of the school. And I thought that this would be relatively easy. It would be a small group of staff, and I could just make stuff up. <laughs> because most of you wouldn't be old enough to know whether I was telling the truth or not. And then Suzette Levinson said that she was going to sit here and fact check me, and I said, oh, all right. And then I walk in, and Ted Colton's sitting right in front of me. So my, I'm pretty much screwed now. Um, I'm going to have to try and play it straight. So, um, but your memory is better than mine. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so let me – what I wanted to do actually was talk more broadly about – public health, academic public health, and the MPH degree, and BU School of Public Health, and sort of weave those, those three things in, um, which will kind of get us to where we are today and some of the stuff that we're, we're dealing with uh, at the school. So um, the, probably the, uh, a major thing to keep in mind is that academic public health, and that's what we are, we're a school of public health. Academ academic public health... Um, is like jazz. It's almost a uniquely American construct. All right. Um, there are now um, 50 accredited schools of public health in the United States. Uh, when I started here, there were only 26. But there were virtually no schools of public health anywhere else in the world. Uh, London was probably the one exception, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So academic public health is a very American construct. Um, and it's only recently uh, that you start seeing there's school in uh, Paris now, there's schools in Asia, they're growing, but this is all very recent, okay? So schools of public health really got started uh, a little over 100 years ago, uh, and that's why you'll see a lot of things happening at the school with the label 2015. You know, we've got MPH 2015, we've got PhD 2015, because the Welch-Rose Report, which was the sort of seminal uh, document uh, for schools of public health, came out in 1915. All right? Some of you may know, uh, if you have medical connections, about the Flexner Report. Uh, and each of these reports dealt with the education in that particular field. So the Flexner Report took what had become kind of an apprenticeship model of medical education in America and said we needed to follow a more German approach with classes and professors and made it much more academic. And the Welch-Rose Report took what was sort of a more diffuse training. Uh, back in those days, a lot of it had to do with sanitarians. Um, you know, it's, we've, uh, although the people in uh, West Virginia don't realize, don't feel this way nowadays, we pretty much can take clean water for granted. Um, but back in those days, sewerage, water was a, a major, major part of public health. Um, so the Welch Rose Report talked about making academic entities that would teach uh, public health. Um, and clearly, if you look back at what was in the curriculum and in the sphere, it was somewhat different than it, than it is now. And following up the Welch Rose Report, um, the Rockefeller Foundation gave grants to uh, three schools, to Hopkins, Harvard, and Columbia, to really get schools of public health going. Okay. So this would have been about 100 years ago. <clears throat> and um, men, the, the schools of public health uh, started with different organizational arrangements. Um, and clearly one of the critical issues, and it continues to be a critical issue for public health in general and for academic public health, is the relationship with schools of medicine. Right? Um, and I've often joked that one of the things I see happening now is that schools of public health spent the last hundred years trying to figure out how to get away from schools of medicine. Um, and increasingly, we're trying to figure out how to reconnect and, and try and make it work better. Right. So um, the MPH then became the focus for education. So that's another thing that you'll see as a historical trend is that public health education um, really is based around the MPH. That was the degree. But if you go back to the MPH in 1915, the only people who got MPHs were doctors, nurses, vets, and dentists, okay? It was specifically designed as a supplemental degree for clinicians. 
Um, and that's the way it was for many years. And I think this is true. People may know, know better may correct me. I still think you don't get an MPH at Harvard unless you're one of those people. You get an MSPH, okay? Uh, so they're continuing the tradition. Harvard also continues the tradition of giving their doctoral degrees as Doctor of Science degrees. And a lot of this stuff is historical, um, I wouldn't say artifact, but it's based on history where uh, the uh, arts and sciences school owned the PhD. So the only way you could give PhDs was to have your degree grow through the graduate school. And a lot of schools of public health said, well, screw that, and we want to give our own degrees. So they gave Doctor of Science degrees. And as you'll, I'll come back to it, we did the same thing when we started, okay? So you've got this, about 100 years ago, uh, really a growth of something called academic public health, schools of public health, started small with this Welch Rose report, and really focused on giving the MPH to clinicians, uh, doctors, and so forth. And over time, what's happened is that a lot of the growth and evolution of schools of public health came from the fact that they were schools. They became increasingly academic. Um, the, the mix between education and research started to shift, okay? So then, um, so you've got public health, academic public health, you've got the MPH degree. Um, and then, you know, jumping, jumping ahead uh, uh, a few years, so we started in 1915, and so the next major milestone was not long after that, Ted Colton was born. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, somewhere in the late, 40s, Bob Meenan was born, so we click, we click ahead by the decade. Um, so then we get to, to Boston University, um, and um, so Boston University really started to get involved with re the, the history of where the public health at, uh, activities come, probably go back into the late 60s, um, where they set up in the medical school one of the earliest departments of uh, social medical sciences and community medicine, I think the name of it is. And many people, there's very few people in this room realize that I am actually the dean of the School of Public Health and the chairman of a department in the medical school. Okay? The department that this School of Public Health grew out of still exists in the medical school. Uh, it's a department of, I think, social medical sciences and community medicine is still the, the title. And I'm the chairman of that department. So I show up in some arcane org chart along with the chairman of biochemistry and the chairman of physiology, and, and there I am. Okay? But that department started to, to deal with teaching. Remember, this is the 60s and, you know, long hair, Birkenstocks, um, and so forth. And the recognition that doctors needed to learn about this stuff. Uh, they needed to learn about uh, broader aspects of health and not just this more technical curriculum. So it, I actually went to medical school here. I arrived in 1968, um, and my class was the first class to use the L building. The L building just opened. So when you come in the lobby there, that's the L building. Um, L110 and L112 were my first and second year med school classrooms. Um, and they were starting to have uh, parts of the med school curriculum that taught us about these interesting new things like Medicare and Medicaid. So those things passed in 1965. So as I'm coming in in 1968 as a medical student, that stuff was starting to get into the curriculum, okay? And I remember vividly, I happened to be interested in that. I was a political science major when I was an undergrad. And most of my classmates were like, why do we need to learn this crap? You know, what, I need to learn the Krebs cycle and physiology and stuff that's really important to being a doctor and the teaching of us about Medicare and Medicaid. So I was actually interested in it, which was sort of a clue as to where I was ultimately headed. So the way that increasingly was taught um, was through the Department of Social Medical Sciences and uh, Community Health. And there was a guy named David French who was brought in to lead that. And then uh, he also did some work in international health, one of the earliest persons working in, in international health. And uh, then they brought in uh, Norm Scotch from Hopkins. And Norm had a lot of connections in... Uh, um, social medical, he was a sociologist by training, and so forth. And Norm became the chair of this department in the medical school with an express um, goal, I mean, that's one of the reasons they brought him in, was to set up a school of public health, okay? So they worked and set up, uh, they had a committee to look at the feasibility, et cetera, et cetera. And they set up the school of public health through the mid-'70s, and the first students were admitted to an MPH program in 1976, 
Okay? And so that's what we date our uh, anniversaries from. All right? Um, this a quick a quick aside. Uh, Boston University did the remarkable pulled off the remarkable feat of celebrating its 150th anniversary 15 years after its 125th anniversary. Okay, <laughs> and it was a real coup for Silber at the time because he was able to get uh, Bush President Bush won and Francoise Mitterrand, the, the president of France, to come to the BU commencement because it was our 150th uh, anniversary. <laughs> and the rationale for it, and if you pay attention to how they say this, um, what happened is BU really started, um, uh, well, they, the date is 1939 now, okay? But if you really look at BU, it started sometime in like the 1850s. But it's then maybe in the 1870s or 1880s, I can't remember when, it annexed a seminary up in Vermont that was older than Boston University. <coughs> and when it merged with it, it adopt, was able to adopt <laughs> their starting date as our starting date. Okay? Um, and so when I came here, um, I was looking at, they had had a 10th anniversary. I was like, ah, damn, they just had the 10th. And, how come? and suddenly I realized what, what they had done is they had celebrated the 10th anniversary on the basis of the first commencement. So they celebrated in 1989 the 10th anniversary because the first commencement was in 1979. So 1989, I came in in 1992 and realized, wait a minute, we actually had our first classes in 1976, so we backdated everything. Right? So we went from our 10th to our 15th in two years or three years or whatever. Okay? So um, they started a school of public health, and the, the, it was approved by the trustees and it was called Boston University School of Public Health, but it was part of the medical school still, okay? And I will tell you all, honestly now, since I'm kind of on my way out, I can be, you know, true confessions. <laughs> um, I will tell folks that I am now in my 22nd year as being dean of School of Public Health. That's not true. Uh, because for the first five or so, I was the director of the School of Public Health, okay? Because I reported to the Dean of the School of Medicine. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, so, so here we are, BU starts as a School of Public Health, um, and it uh, had, I think, if I saw the books, that then it evolved into like two broad departments, were like health services, I can't, I can't remember exactly what they were, but it wasn't as developed as it is now. Does that make you the only dean at the School of Public Health? Technically, yes, um, but we don't do it that way because we think of Norm Scotch as the founding dean um, because the title was, a, it's like being a, a doctor of science degree versus a PhD. It had to do with just the, um, the politics of the university, not with you know, the actual job <coughs> description, okay? So, School of Public Health started in 1976, and this was an example, we go back now to public health in general, academic public health and the MPH. So the primary design of the School of Public Health when it started was mid-career MPH students, okay? Uh, it was set up explicitly with evening classes. It was also scheduled with these, you know, two and a half, three hour class blocks, so people could come in once a week uh, and take a class and not have to disrupt their work, all right? Um, it also had, quite honestly, the added benefit of increasing classroom usage. Uh, you weren't in direct competition with the <laughs> medical school and dental school classes that tended to be in the daytime, okay? So the express design originally for the MPH program was for mid-career people who were working at you know, DPH or the Public Health Commission or other things, to come back and get an MPH to increase their knowledge and potentially also, you know, increase their uh, promotion and job prospects, okay? Now, this was a very real difference from what the MPH had originally been, okay? The MPH had originally been a supplementary degree for clinicians back in, the, you know, 1915, and by the time we started 50 years later, um, we were really targeting a different group, Okay? And that explains why you look and say, wow, that's interesting. There's a lot of classes at night. It's also this, you know, block scheduling. Because even if you did everything at night, but you had people coming to the campus 
uh, twice a week for an hour and a half, that's a whole different logistical problem, okay? Um, and as you'll see, we'll talk, we'll come back to this, the MPH has continued to evolve. It's evolved here and it's evolved nationally, and we've gone from a supplementary degree for clinicians to a mid-career master's degree to an, essentially an entry-level master's degree, all right? And it actually happened here at BU, um, really started to see it back uh, when I first came here. Um, so I started in 1992, and I, I pointed out after five years, the difference between my age and the age, average age of the entering class had changed two years. Every year it changed by two years. The students got a year younger and I got a year older, okay? So when I started, the average age of the entering MPH student was around 32, 33, and over five years it went down to like 27. And now I think it's, what, 26? It's, it's in that ballpark. It's still, all right? Um, and now it, it became a whole different group of students because um, these were uh, students coming directly out of college in many cases or after a year or two um, as opposed to the, you know, maybe the mid-30 types that we originally had. It, it led to interesting hybridization in the classroom um, depending on, on which topic you were teaching. This was either really exciting or really problematic. So for, I remember the biostatisticians were complaining because the young students were blowing their grading curves. They, they, were, they were too good with the math. They understood it. They could do SAS and stuff like that. Um, and then the population health departments were saying, these kids don't know anything. You know, they're just a little naive. So we, we, we integrated it, and it continued to work. But the, the proportions of those two groups has just steadily shifted. They started coming in the, um, you know, maybe the mid-'90s, and, that, and, and it's continued. So uh, our prototypical student, who used to be a 33-year-old um, Department of Public Health employee, is now a, you know, 24-year-old, relatively fresh out of college student, okay? So is that true at the other Yes, the yep. And now, but then you get this whole issue. Um, so as this has evolved, now we, we do, as you know, we do four plus one programs with the undergraduate students. So these, these students aren't even out of college yet. They're taking some courses here and then coming for one more year and getting their MPH, okay? But the, if we talk about one of the themes, so we've got a theme of academic public health, we've got a theme of the MPH, and we've got a theme of BU School of Public Health. But the other thing that's happened now if I stick with the MPH theme, is an absolute explosion of bachelor's degrees in public health, okay? Um, back when I started, we would have people coming and saying, wow, I didn't even know about public health. This is sort of neat. Let me, let me, let me do this. And now we've got um, programs cropping up everywhere with bachelor's degrees in public health, all right? So if you think of a supplemental degree for doctors going all the way through the spectrum of um, uh, degree for a uh, mid-career degree to entry-level master's degree to bachelor's degree, okay? And um, it's become a very popular uh, field. I went to a talk about a, two months ago, uh, and the introduction was given by uh, the president of Harvard, and it is now the, uh, the most popular, they don't call them minors, but it's, it's particularly what it is, the most popular minor at Harvard College is, is public health, okay? Um, so here at BU, we are doing the 4 plus 1 program. We're offering um, survey classes for undergraduates, but the university has not decided not to offer a bachelor's degree in public health. But that, it still affects us because we, we no longer can assume that our students coming in don't know anything about public health. And so Epi 101 or Epi 1, we're now going to increasingly see students who have knowledge there. and we, It affects the pedagogy and how we slot them in and so forth. So going back just 100 years for a supplemental degree for doctors to this whole spectrum of um, master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, and then finally I think we're, we're seeing a slow but steady reemergence of the DRPH. We set up our program here about 10 years ago, I think, all right? So, um, so let me switch back. So what's happened at, at BU then? Um, so in the time that I've been here. I think when I started, um, we had roughly 50 full-time faculty. It's now like about 140, something in that ballpark. Uh, the annual operating budget was about 
$12 million. Now it's about 80, 82, okay? Um, we probably had 400 students. Now we've got 1,000. Um, so the place has gotten a lot bigger. The other thing that's happened, and this has been an interesting um, uh, development at the school, we talk about the, the Welch Rose Report and we talk about degrees and we talk about the education side of a, of a school. Well, as you know, a place like this also does research. And it's been a remarkable um, evolution of that as well. So when I came in 92, um, in that modest budget, a, pro at least two-thirds of it was from teaching. Okay, that's how that was what the budget looked like. That's how the faculty spent their time. About two thirds teaching, one third research. Uh, and then about three years ago, four years ago, we realized we had reached the point where those ratios had completely reversed. It had become two thirds research and one third education. All right, and one of the things we've done over the past couple of years is grow our education program because um, we're, we're trying to keep somewhere in the ballpark of fifty fifty. It it just makes sense in terms of. Um, kind of intellectual activity, a balance of work, and quite frankly, it, for a whole variety of reasons, it makes sense uh, financially as well. Um, so the school has gotten a lot bigger, and it's gotten a lot larger in terms of its research activities. Okay. Um, so the what's happened uh, in more broadly in public health, uh, and I, this sort of gets me back to the MPH again. Um, I just finished chairing a national committee on redesigning the MPH. Um, it had this sort of grandiose notion of the MPH for the 21st century. Um, so we've just filed that report. And uh, as many of you know, Lisa Sullivan is leading a task force here to look at our MPH degree and how that works. And what the national uh, task force has recommended is that now that we realize this, this MPH, which used, used to be kind of the Swiss Army knife and a generalist degree, we've now got a bachelor's degree, we've got doctor of public health, um, what should the MPH, um, how should it be positioned, what should it do? And what we've recommended is that the MPH should increasingly be a, um, um, oh, yes. Is that it? You're welcome. <laughs> um, that the MPH increasingly needs to be a concentration degree. Um, especially, you know, people coming in with bachelor's education already, that you need to have a good set of skills in a particular field so that when you go out and, and get a job, you actually can be a, a reasonable epidemiologist or a you know, health policy person or whatever. Okay? So we're trying to, trying to work that through. Um, and the other thing that, that as, as you know, has happened is public health has just exploded in general. And so I look, I often say, well, here the school has done that, and the school has gotten this much bigger, and Jesus, did I do a good job, all right? And I realized it, I kind of like, it's like I bought Microsoft stock when it first came out. You know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. So I switched from medicine uh, into public health in 1992, um, and the, 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 the field just exploded. And the undergraduates are interested in it because it's a remarkably interesting field for a 21st century citizen. It's got economics, it's got policy, it's got global stuff, and ultimately it's got health, and you know, everybody's interested in health. Uh, research money has gotten better, uh, so it's been a lot of the reasons why it's been able, been able to grow so much. Um, so the School of Public Health now um, is, can I do the math quickly in my head? So it's uh, 1976, so we're about 38 now, I guess, the 40th birthday in a couple of years. It's been a, a great success story. Um, oh, I, I forgot one big, one other big transition. So we've talked about how the degree has transitioned. We've talked about how public health in general has transitioned. The school has transitioned as well. Um, there have been three or four big steps that have really, really made a difference. Um, probably the, the most visible, and I think it came first, uh, was the Talbot building. All right. So uh, when I started, uh, Ted was here. Suzette was here. I don't know if anybody else in the room was here back then. Howard. Howard? Okay. Um, we were scattered around. Uh, we had some people in the Talbot building. We had some folks in the A building. And I remember vividly, um, it was announced in September of 1992 that I was going to take over the School of Public Health starting November 1. 
And one of my colleagues in the Department of Medicine stopped me right out in front of the main entrance here and said, Bob, that's really great. That's great. That's awesome. Where is the School of Public Health? Okay? <laughs> um, so we, did, we didn't have a presence. Um, and, and then uh, one day a guy named Dick Toll, who was the VP, business VP for the university at that time, said, would the School of Public Health be interested in the Talbot building? And I said to him, is this a trick question? <laughs> now, clearly there was money involved. This wasn't going to be a freebie. But um, so it was it, it, absolutely. So we were able to, they, they completely gutted the Talbot building, completely renovated it. Uh, brief history of the Talbot building. It was the first hospital here in the South End, okay? And Norman Sc Scotch was born in the Talbot building, okay? So, and if you go into the, if you go into the main entrance, uh, by and say hi to Benita and, and walk up and look at the walk up and look at the panels. You'll see photos there of the old buildings and you'll see nurses and you'll see operating rooms. That's that's what the Talbot originally was. Okay, and uh, it had gone um, gone to seed, quite frankly. Um, and just about the time they were offering it to us, two of our departments. I know I know E H was up over there. Were you guys over there as well? Okay, we had to move two of our departments out because. The roof had started leaking up on the fifth floor west. And since the hospital didn't have a lot of money, they just took everybody out of the fifth floor and put like a vapor barrier down on the floor, which turned out to grow the largest fungus infestation you can possibly imagine. So there were spores of everything floating through that building. They had to vacate the whole building. Right? So back then when they said, would you like the Talbot, you went, uh. <laughs> so, so anyway, they, they, completely, they completely gutted it. Um, we went through the process of lying a bit about how much space we needed so we could get as much as possible. Um, and we moved in there, um, I think, October of 97, okay? And that was transformational. Um, it is right on the quad. You know, everybody knows where we are. Um, it is a fantastic match between the sort of ethos of a school and what the building looks like, you know? That's, you know, the medical school wouldn't work in there, and we wouldn't work over here, okay? It's a historical site. It's a historical site. Yeah, it's actually, uh, and they won awards for the, for the restoration. And those of you who are in there may take it for granted, but one of the things I've always felt is when you're in the Talbot building, you always know you're in an old building. You know it's a restored building. I mean, you just see features, windows and, you know, everything else that reminds you that you're, you're in an old building. So that happened in 97. Uh, in and then the next thing that happened that was big for the school was that there was a major change in the organizational chart of the university. Uh, there was a very um, uh, remarkable guy named Dick Eggdahl who was, had been the chairman of surgery at the medical school. And I had actually done some work for him when I was a student. Uh, he became the VP for health affairs. And he actually oversaw uh, the School of Medicine, the School of Public Health, um, dental school, sergeant, and social work, okay? And he did that for a number of years. And then he stepped down, and they created the provost position, which is still there now. So Karen Antman is the, the provost of the medical campus. But what that did was it allowed them to change the title of the head of the School of Public Health to dean because they didn't want a dean reporting to a dean, all right? So I literally had this phenomenon where I, I went to see Aaron Chobanian who had now been named provost, I went to see him one day and reported to him as the director of the School of Public Health, and he was the dean of the School of Medicine. The next day, he was also the provost of the medical campus, and I reported to him as the dean of the School of Public Health. Okay? So it just was a, a change in title, and I'm trying to remember when that happened. Uh, I think it was just after the uh, 92, 97, yeah, maybe 99, something like that. Um, and then the third big change, and I know this is not something that most people think about, um, it had to do with our finances. Um, and so the School of Public Health is, um, used to be set up so that the tuition came into the school and the, the, the school kept 70% and 30% of it came over to the med school and the med school covered all our expenses. Okay, um, And then about... I don't know what it would be now, Pat, seven years ago, something like that. Uh, we switched to a separate budget system where we, all the money comes to the school. So the tuition money, the, the grant money, the indirect cost money, the, the donation money, it all comes to the school, and we pay all our own costs. Okay? 
um, which is a, a, a nice autonomy to have. There's only three schools at BU that run that way, the three schools on this campus. Um, every other school at BU gets a, a budget from the university. So when Pat and I go in and meet with the president, we don't ask him for an amount of money. We just tell him how much we think we're going to make and how we're going to spend it and how we're using, how we're doing that strategically. Okay. So it's all, it's all evolved uh, quite remarkably. Um, you know, we've gone from being a small program within the medical school to an independent school. Uh, we've been doing this at the same time that public health academia has been growing. The research aspects of schools of public health have grown. As I said, we've gone from 26 schools of public health to 50 accredited schools of public health. Um, there, again, uh, each one doing a, a fair amount of research. Um, so it's really been a, an interesting development. So where are we now? So um, as, I, as I said when I sent out my uh, announcement back in November about uh, stepping down, that um, this is, a, in general, a very interesting time for higher education. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening, whether it's MOOCs or you know, tuition issues or demographics. There aren't as many. There won't be as many students as there used to be, um, just be because the, the demographics are flattening out a little bit. Um, and by and large, society is being much more uh, demanding of higher education, both in a good way and a bad way. Some of the demands are the amount of regulation involved in running the school now is stunning. Um, we just spent a whole hour and a half at a dean's meeting. There is now um, a minors on campus you know, issue, and guess where that comes from? Penn State, okay? So now if you have minors on campus and you've got to make sure people have background checks and all, you know, stuff you just took for granted. You know, we're doing a good deal. We're bringing some kids from the community in, and now all of a sudden we're going to have to. There's a new regulation on um, foreign travel by students, okay, that if you are doing a BU program in a country that's on the State Department watch list or concern list, you're going to have to get an exemption. You're going to have to get a specific waiver. And we even talked about the. So if you're from Nigeria and you're a student at the School of Public Health, you can go home at intercession, be, be our guest, okay? But if you want to stay there in the spring to do your practicum, you need permission, okay? Now, I understand where this is all coming from. It's all risk management and so forth. But um, uh, conflict of interest laws, um, effort reporting laws. It's just, it's remarkable. And I know the faculty at times is frustrated because they say, well, you know, we've only added five faculty members in the past year and we've added 10 administrators. Trust me. Uh, we don't do it because that's how we want to spend the money, but, but, but you can't run it otherwise. So, there's, so that's the bad part of being challenged by society. But society is also saying, in a sense, justify that you're worth it. Um, you're very expensive now. You have different curricula at Harvard than at BU. This shouldn't be rocket science. Shouldn't Epi 101 look pretty much the same? What's going on here? Even to the point where you talk to different schools and say, what's a credit hour? Um, and nobody has a, a similar answer. So uh, on the one hand, it's a very challenging time for higher education, but School of Public Health, I think, is in really good shape. I think we are, um, I've often used the term postmodern in a way, um, and I like many of the things about the school, that we have an, enough independence to really chart our own course. I think we are academic without being overly academic. You know, public health is basically an applied craft, um, and we are a bit of an ivory tower, but we're a lot more connected uh, to the real world than a, than a lot of schools are. And I, I sometimes sit in meetings with the deans over on the uh, uh, Charles River campus, and my eyes glaze over. Um, in terms of some of the issues that are being played out there because they're very, very ivory towerish. Um, we, our faculty don't have tenure, which is quite remarkable. Um, and I think that's going to be something that will happen to almost every school at some point. You can imagine what, the, what most society in general thinks about faculty tenure. Um, it seems pretty, pretty odd to them. So I think the school is in great shape financially. I think we're in a field that's continuing to grow. Um, uh, you know, we've gotten critical mass in terms of our size, our applications continue to go up. And I think the challenges for us are, you know, how do we change our MPH so that it fits what students need? Uh, how do we manage our costs reasonably? And uh, how is this balance of research going to come out when, with all the federal um, 
you know, cost cutting and budget cutting that's going on. Okay. Um, so why don't I stop there? I've tried to interweave um, public health in general, um, the MPH degree, and BU School of Public Health, and sort of take you uh, from where things were what, about 100 years ago to where they are now. And about, as I said, 38 years of that history includes the, the BU School of Public Health. Now, let me just ask as a matter of courtesy if uh, anybody wants to correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ted. Can I sort of sure, please. Um, what you, I think what you didn't say, um, which is which, when I, I came here in 1980, uh, which is not when the school started, and um, it was really a very bold venture in, pu in uh, public health education. Most of you said, how many schools were there? There were only about 20 in the country. Yeah, but. And most states didn't have any school of public health. And the idea of having a new school of public health in the same city as one of the really dominant schools of public health was a very bold experiment. And the, as, as Bob said, he maybe didn't stress it enough, it was stressed to me when I came here, the goal of the mission of the new school of public health at BU was, just as he said, to train, or, or, I, the word, I, word as I heard, were workers in the trenches. Maybe I feel like when I talk about this, front lines is better. So it was really not to train the health professional. The goal was not to train who were going to become the leaders in the field. It was saying that those people who were working in the field merited a public education, and some of them would, of course, we would anticipate become leaders in the field. And this was really uh, a very new and very successful. Um, I want to make another comment, too, about the organization of BU. Um, I don't know the relationship that Bob has with the medical school and deans there, but I have previously been at Harvard. I was not at Harvard School of Public Health. I was at Harvard Medical School uh, prior to, uh, well, in the, uh, maybe in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s. And uh, Lou, you're, you, I think you're from the Harvard School of Public Health. I was at the medical school, and there was tremendous animosity between the medical school and the School of Public Health. Even though they were all in that Longwood area, that parking lot between the School of Public Health and the medical school was really a thought, tremendous resentment and uh, antagonism between the deans of the two schools. And whatever it is, I think that the model here of the School of Public Health being within the uh, uh, medical school and that connection back and forth is so much easier, at least what, in my field, my initial field as a biostatistician, this was really great in terms of working with clinicians and not having to cross these differences between the two schools. I want to say another thing about the Talbot building. As Bob mentioned, our department was in the Talbot prior to its uh, restoration. And um, we, we, you could hear the mice in the one <laughs> <laughs> who had any like um, problem with uh, uh, their lungs or anything. The gold was, uh, was absolutely uh, fantastic. And then after the restoration coming back to the Talbot building, I just want to say, I don't know what Bob feels is. If he had to pick one accomplishment that was his signature, his biggest contribution to the School of Public Health, I would say it was the Talbot building. Having been there before and after, <laughs> That alone is testament <laughs> to his achievement as uh, dean of the School of Public Health. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, the other one, the, actually, I, I should have mentioned this, that um, I'll just tell you a, a funny story and then segue to a, a, probably a second major achievement. So um, I went to, as I said, I went to med school here, and I trained at City Hospital, and then I uh, went off for a few years and came back. Um, and I was actually the chief of rheumatology at the time I moved over to the School of Public Health. Um, and so I had this interesting, I was talking about going in to, to meet with Aaron Trobani, and one day I was reporting to him as the director, and the next day I was reporting to him as the dean. Okay, But the even odder thing was for a year, I reported to him as the dean, 
and I was also the president of his alumni association, <laughs> okay, which was sort of uh, interesting. So I, I was a uh, – when I went over to School of Public Health, um, it was a controversial choice um, because the School of Public Health – saw me largely as a physician being sent over from the medical school to keep tabs on them, all right? And I remember saying that it's not, don't worry about it, I'm your Trojan horse. I can get more stuff done with the medical school than virtually anybody else because they all know me and they all trust me. And I think, by and large, it turned out to be that. But my, my favorite story about this was David Ozanoff, many of you know, um, was the chairman of environmental health at that time, and he was on the search committee. And uh, after it had been announced that I was going to take the job, he made an appointment and came to see me in my office. And in typical David style, he said, look, I just want to let you know that I think you're a lousy choice and I voted against you. <laughs> okay? And I told him, this is a true story, I said, well, that's, that's interesting, David, because Norm Scotch, the outgoing dean, told me there are two people in the school I need to fire immediately, and you're one of them. <laughs> okay? And thus a beautiful friendship was born. I mean, David and I, David and I got along extremely well. Um, my other, my other in, uh, favorite time of David is when I went to the city council hearing on the, um, on the needle, on the Emerging Infectious Diseases Lab, and there were four people testifying from BU in favor of the lab, and there were four people testifying against the lab, and two of the against people were SPH faculty members, okay, which was a sort of uh, interesting. Uh, but the med school stuff is always a, an interesting balance thing. So the other person um, who was the other person I was supposed to fire immediately was Dave Ozenoff and Bill Bicknell, okay? <laughs> now, if you've worked with Bill, you can understand where some of that comes from, okay? Um, but Bill, Bill at that time had literally been exiled over to the Charles River campus. He was running this small Center for International Health. And I said in my naivete, Bill, come on back to the School of Public Health. We'll start an international health department. And, he said, and I said, and you'll work for me. And that was my naivete, as if, anybody, <laughs> as if Bill worked for anybody. Um, <laughs> but Bill said, okay. So Bill came over and started a department from scratch. Um, you know, with concentrators and curriculum and advising and all that stuff. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, once that got up and running, uh, Susie Foster took over from Bill and helped recruit John Simon and a group from Harvard. Um, and I've often said one of the most uh, odd things in my career is, um, you probably can tell from the accent, I'm a native Bostonian. A native Bostonian rheumatologist started an outstanding international health department in a school of public health. Who knew? Where did that come from? So I would say the Talbot uh, is one, and clearly the, um, um, the international health department is another, and probably just the, the growth of the school in general, although that was more a matter of not screwing it up because there was so much, so much positive momentum. All right, um, questions? I have to just yeah. comment on your, uh, your story about David. Mm -hmm. was enough. Just the other day, Oh, did he? <laughs> he said, I admit I was wrong. David, 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 to his credit, has told me that. Um, um, and I tell him I'm not sure whether I should. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so. But it was, it was an interesting. Um, I understood what it was about both David and Bill that was frustrating at times, okay? But didn't bother me. I mean, the, the, the good parts more than outweighed the, the other parts of it. So it was an interesting story. Other things? Other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, I have a specific question about the Talbot building. Mm -hmm. And a comment. Um, I learned recently that the um, architect of the Talbot yeah. building was a pretty well-known architect in right. New England and was Ralph, Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson's cousin. Right. Which I think is kind of yep. cool. Yep. Um, but the specific question I have is, I think I read on the wall there was a plaque about the building building had been in the movie The Cardinal. Yeah. So I watched that movie, The Cardinal, and I didn't see it, yeah. but it might be because <laughs> it was before the renovation and it's yeah, changed could be. a lot. Could so be. do you, does no, anyone I'd... here know where in that movie no. the building is? No. Oh, okay. No. 
It just reminds me, the other one that they talk about is that the Dowling Amphitheater over at City Hospital was in the movie Coma, um, and that's about to disappear. So the building was built in three parts, as you know, if you go over there. But the other news for folks, if you don't know it, is that uh, we are getting more space in the Talbot fairly shortly. Um, so across the street where campus convenience, the city convenience is there, they're moving um, over to where the bookstore used to be, and sub, there's going to be a subway opening there too, okay? And that is fairly soon, isn't it? End of the month, okay? Kinko's is moving to where city convenience currently is. It's, it's just across the street. Uh, oh, now, wait a minute. This is really going really to get me in trouble. And the ATM is moving, too, okay? All right. And Mass, and mass Medic is moving. So that has been a rather... That's been a rather patchwork um, part of that, that one west, and, and we're going to be able to take it all over um, and, and move folks in there. So it really has been a, you know, and, and I certainly, you, you guys all know this, you look at the bus, you look at BU Publications. I mean, the Talbot building is all over the place. I mean, they, they show it on everything. So it was a, it was a, it was a great move. So. Other questions, comments? Yes. Bob, in your 22 years, if you think of any, Yeah. Um, where we've been able to have some sort of impact or um, positive effect. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I talk about the ivory tower thing. A, a few years ago, um, you know, everybody remembers 9-11, and you also have to remember that shortly after 9-11, the anthrax letters appeared in the Senate building. Um, and some of my friends said to me, man, oh, man, you must have been going crazy with all the scares about anthrax. And I said, uh, I'm a dean. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not the head of the public health department, okay? So, um, you know, academia, for better or worse, tends to ride over those, those bumps. Um, the, so, you know, there's been, I don't know, I don't, I don't so, so if I think back, and this is, this is a piece of history that uh, some folks here will remember. Um, I think the single most, um, I think the, the, the work in the school in the time that I was there that had the most impact on a public health problem was Ralph Hinkson um, and drunk driving. Right? And Ralph was the chairman of what was then Social and Behavioral Sciences, which is now Community Health Sciences. And Ralph um, was started to do work on this and formed a remarkable alliance with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. So almost all of the, the things that we take for granted now, um, 0.08 blood alcohol, so-called per se laws, uh, administrative license revocation, all that sort of stuff, um, even some of the licensing around you know, 16-year-olds and so forth, came out of the work that Ralph did. Um, and if you look at, and I, I realize there's other things involved like road engineering and car design and so on and so forth, but if you look at the in America, and this is not true internationally, if you look in America at the death from in motor vehicle accidents, that the, it it just has gone like down like a rock, um, and it was a classic example also of this wasn't just that Ralph published some papers and then sat back. I mean, Ralph was trial. He went to state legislatures. He went with the parents of kids who had died in you know traffic accidents from MAD and testified before the state legislatures and and. You know, there's a lot of a lot of the state legislatures uh, legislators are lawyers. A lot of them defend drunk driving clients, and so they, there was a little bit of conflict of interest. But I actually remember nominating Ralph for a big national award a couple of times because I thought that was the the, the biggest impact. Um, now we've also participated in a whole bunch of other things. You know, AIDS in Africa. Um, you know, and I don't want to start naming things because then I'll forget forget some things. But that's the one that sort of pops out. I don't think of that, I think of that as a, a public health, um, a real public health problem that we helped address. Schools, by definition, don't deal with crises very well. You know, they just don't. We just don't, we just don't mobilize in that sort of way. But I, that one has always stuck with me. So. And interesting enough, Ralph, when Ralph left here, he went to, he, you know, it's interesting, it was like, 
I left medicine because I could see public health had a broader impact. And Ralph left the School of Public Health, I think, for the same reason. He went down to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to be a, you know, a major leader there and you know, have a broader impact. I yeah. have one comment on Ralph is that Suzette and I worked with him for a long time. And Ralph was a pure academic, and there were other people in his department who were a little bit more involved in advocacy uh, at the time who told him, Ralph, to really have an impact, you have to move out of the ivory tower and, and, and kind of and, uh, relate to people a little bit more and in the level of advocacy. And that's how things changed. Yeah. And Ralph became an advocate. But before that, he went kicking yeah. and screaming in that direction. As an academic, you have to be totally divorced from advocacy. And he's, he's really changed, and I think he really made the impact of what he did. So much bigger. it just proves that people can evolve. Uh, but it also, the thing I remember about Ralph, now you uh, younger folks, get ready for this. He didn't do email. <laughs> he still doesn't. He still doesn't. <laughs> people, people are looking like I said he had three heads with one pointing in that. <laughs> so. All right, any other questions? Yes. I had one follow-up yeah. question from Matt. What do you think the relationship between academics and advocacy has been in the past for the School of Public Health, and you know, how would you see it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's um, first of all, as I think I alluded to this, schools of public health, particularly this school of public health, are in a substantially different place on the advocacy spectrum than most institutions of higher education. Uh, it's partly due to the nature of the work that we do. I think in this school, it's also partly due to the fact that you literally grew up right across the street from Boston City Hospital and the Public Health Commission and so forth. So public health as a field is much more involved in advocacy than most academic institutions are. Um, I think we are... Um, you know, could we be more involved? Yes. Um, but I think we, we really do look at um, how our research has an impact. So um, like in Don, uh, International Health, Don Thea, they changed the WHO guidelines for treating childhood pneumonia because of work that he did. All right? And sometimes it's, that just didn't happen by chance. They went out and they, they pushed the findings and so forth. So it's, a, it's an interesting balance, uh, but I think it's, I, I, like pretty, I like where we are. Jeff? One of the things I remember that typifies the school for me is when we had the controversy after opening uh, across town uh, with the traffic and the accidents and that sort of thing, oh, yeah. that the dean uh, of the school himself was out there with those of us who were protesting around and making a statement about something that needed to be addressed in public health that just said a lot about not being necessarily stuck in the night. Well, Jeff, I appreciate that, because when you raised your hand and said you wanted to say something, remember, I was, sure, I was almost sure it was going to have something to do with beer. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, was one of the highlights of my career here. When I had... Well yeah, yeah. Um, was it my 50th birthday? I think so. It was my 50th birthday... Uh, they had a surprise party for, and they actually did surprise me. They had fifty different bottles, fifty different kinds of beer, for my birthday. It was great. I took it home. My son and I lasted about a week, uh, <laughs> but there was a thought that counted. What can I say? So. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all. <laughs>